Now, as a plumber, I've spent most of my work in life trying to get water into the right place at the right time, in the right quantities and at the right temperature. I haven't always succeeded in that. Sometimes it's gone a little bit of drift, but we won't go into that now. Anyway, I learned a bit about water at college. I also learned a little bit about water in my science lessons, as I'm sure you did. But what I want to talk about in this video is the relevance of those general principles to you at home, whether you're a plumber, a tradesman, or even just a householder. How does all this affect you? I was shown this little trick by the science teacher, probably, or somebody else, but I've tried to impress kids with it ever since. And it is simply that the water doesn't come out of the glass. Now, I'm sure you know why that happens. It's because atmospheric pressure at sea level is capable of supporting a column of water up to 9.8 meters high. So that could be not just a glass, but 9.8 meters high, which is rather incredible, I think. Now, the reason it works is because we haven't got atmospheric pressure on the top of the water. It's only acting on this beer mat on the underside of it. So because we've got the dome over the top, there's no way that the atmospheric pressure can get in at the top and equalize it. How does that relate to you at home? Well, have you ever heard of an airlock? An airlock happens when, say, you've got a water tank and you've got a tap. Now, you'll notice that this pipe is running slightly uphill. That's not a mistake in my drawing for once. What it is, a deliberate attempt to show you what happens if you run on a gravity system that is a non-mains pressure system and you have a slight rise in the pipe. What happens is the air collects in that point there, that high spot. So here is our true level and the plumber for one reason or another has gone slightly uphill. Could be the joists in the house are running that way, so he's just followed the line of the joists. But whatever it is, we have this little airlock here, so we've got water here, we might even have water there, but that water can't go come out of a tap for exactly the same reason as I showed you in the glass. So the way we get round that is we put that pipe in so that any air in it vents towards the tank and just bubbles up out of there. Now that means level will do because it'll just run along there or downhill is even better so that the pipes are rising back to the tank. And in that way, we avoid airlocks. Now, if we do get airlocks and you know the pipe's laid, we're not gonna relay the pipe. What we can do is put an air valve in there, an air release valve in there to take out that little bit of air. You can use that with a radiator key, or sometimes you get an automatic air valve, which simply goes in the top and you bleed that off and, and it just collects the air and releases it automatically. They weep a little bit though, so I wouldn't leave them open, but uh, they're a good device for that. Now, this can happen in a central heating system, it can happen in a hot water system or a cold water system. The way I get rid of airlocks, if all we're trying to do is get the water running and we're not worried about fixing the problem for good, if it's not a persistent airlock, then we don't worry. So what we then do is we just simply put some mains pressure on the end of a tap, blast it through there, and because mains pressure is more than that 9.8 meters that I spoke about, it will blast that airlock out no problem at all. So what else do we know about water? Well, obviously we know that water is very, very important in terms of keeping us alive. We couldn't survive without it. In fact, we're made up mostly of water. Even your brain is about 60% water. So. Keep drinking, don't let it dry out. Cities around the world have grown up, people have gone to live by water because they want a clean drinking supply. And we're lucky in the countries we live in, hopefully the country you live in, where you have access to a clean drinking supply at the tap, and it's a plumber's job to keep that clean, to not contravene any of the laws that govern the way that water is piped into our house and avoid contamination and, of course, wastage because water is a very valuable resource. A lot of the world has to do without it. They have to manage on minimal amounts. They reckon that 200 million hours a year are spent just 
gathering water from wells, from rivers for people to drink. Another sobering thought is that every single hour, 200 children die as a result of contaminated water, diseases that come from not having a clean water supply. If you contrast that with COVID, for example, it's way ahead of that. So if you want to worry about something, worry about clean water. We've really got to do our best to protect it. Now, it's a bit of a marvel, really. Water is, I mean, this is the same water that's been around since the beginning of time. There's no more and there's no less on this planet than there ever used to be. So this water has been recycled time after time. It evaporates up into the clouds, which is a distillation process, a purification process. It falls as rainwater, it runs through the ground. And when it runs through the ground, it picks up contaminants. This isn't pure water. I live in a hard water area and this contains a certain amount of lime and other minerals. No bad thing, it's a very nice tasting, good quality water. In actual fact, let's just think about this. This water has been recycled since the beginning of time. So we've got no way of knowing where this water comes from. This could be Julius Caesar's urine sample, for example. Hmm. Et tu brute? Shall I go there? No, I won't go there. <laughs> Maybe you've got a list of people you would like to drink. Anyway, never mind. Let's move swiftly on. What's the practical benefit of what I'm saying? One thing, obviously, is you don't waste your water. You value it. You keep it. But the other thing is that you've got to remember that the water has picked up things from the ground as it's come through. So it fell as rain, reasonably pure, because obviously it was distilled. As it came down through the air, it probably picked up airborne pollutants. It picked up a little bit of radiation in some places, in the case of Chernobyl, and that fell on whales. Everything falls on whales. And um, it uh, contaminated the water slightly. You know, radioactive, it wouldn't make you glow in the dark, but it's not great, is it? But it picks up other minerals and pollutants and things as it runs through the ground, as it runs to our rivers and our streams and our reservoirs, it picks up different contaminants and different minerals. They're not all contaminants, but they are all contaminants, but some of them aren't bad for you. In different parts of the country, in different parts of the world, you've got water which is characterized by the landscape around it. So if it's running through granite and things like that, it's not picking up very much in the way of contaminants and it comes out as soft water. When you wash with it, you get lovely hair. That's not this, by the way, because I live in a hard water area. But if you live in a hard water area, you can never seem to get a good soap and a good lather. All your taps are scaled up, your boiler, your water heater, everything gets scale, scale, scale on it. And you might need a water softener in those particular instances. But that scale does have a tremendous effect upon our plumbing system because scale is an insulator. So going back to our familiar cylinder, with our coil running through it. If this is in a hard water area, that coil will gather scale because as you heat water up, it deposits scale. The more you heat it up, the more it deposits scale, which is why those water boilers that people have, those taps are such a disaster in hard water areas because they're just picking up scale, scale, scale all the time. Now, if you boil water or you bring it anywhere near boiling point, the amount of scale that it produces is almost total. It's almost everything that's in the water turns to scale and it lines this coil. And as it lines the coil, it is an insulator. Therefore, that coil becomes less effective. So the water's coming from the boiler. It's coming in here. It's going around there. But because it's surrounded by a, a thick deposit of scale in some cases, it will just not give up its heat to the cylinder. And you will find it's just going back to the boiler, switching the boiler off. The way to get around that is to descale the cylinder, put some mild acid inside the cylinder, leave it there for 24 hours, and then drain it out again and you start to get the efficiency back. Now I've taken out loads and loads of these cylinders as have many plumbers and in the bottom of the cylinder you get a build up and when you go to lift a cylinder up you know what the weight of a cylinder is because you bought them from the plumbers merchants and when you empty them from water you expect them to be reasonably lightweight. Sometimes they weigh an absolute ton because all that scale has built up, it's dropped off the coil or it's just come out of the water and it's gathered in that space in the bottom. Now there's something even worse and that is that the cold feed that comes into the cylinder, in the case of the vented cylinder this is, is in the bottom like that. It's pushing 
under not a great deal of pressure because we've got a tank in the loft here under a not great deal of pressure it's trying to push its way through and of course what's happened is that we've got a scale build up we've got this stuff it's lying there just like concrete if you like in the bottom of the cylinder and that water is trying to get through there and it can't get through there because it's blocked up with scale so we've got more problems reasons why you've got to descale your cylinder and if possible take it out drain it off and make sure you do a really good job of it for people living in hard water that's a problem for people living in soft water that isn't a problem but one thing you do get in soft water areas is what they call plumbo solvency so if you've got lead pipe in a soft water area then that lead is being dissolved taken into solution every time the water passes through it the soft water passes through it it's what they call plumbo solvent which is a very posh term plumbo from the romans and solvent from well, us, I suppose, but anyway, that's it. Plumbo solvent, which means that it eats the lead. And of course, that lead finishes up in your drinking water. And in the end, if you have enough lead, it starts to affect your brain, which probably explains something about me. As a plumber, I've handled an awful lot of lead in the past. I don't touch it now. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to tell you about water is that water finds its own level. We put a hose pipe, if you like, or any kind of pipe, between those two vessels and we fill up either one of those vessels with water the water goes down the pipe comes up there so long as there's no air in it what happens is it finds exactly the same level some of the flat earthers will point out that if that happens the world can't be round because they say if it was round it would go in actual fact it does follow the curvature of the earth so over a big distance over several kilometers you will find that that water will be wrapped around the surface of the earth unless of course you believe that the earth is flat and if you believe the earth is flat there's no help in you that's a very useful thing to know that water finds its own level because as builders we use that sometimes in a water level especially if we try to level things around a corner we get ourselves a water level we've got a video on that and you can use that to tremendous effect the romans the greeks all those civilizations long ago used water they didn't use hose pipes they didn't have hose pipes but they did it by filling a trench or filling a vessel and putting a mark on the vessel and then leveling the thing up and by that means they could level their buildings out we know they're level because the buildings are still standing there we can put our lasers on there and marvel at how well they did with some crude devices such as water and a couple of sticks so hats off to the romans hats off to the greeks the byzantians and anybody else that you care to mention in regard to good building so here's another little fact for you one liter of water equals one kilo in weight also gets even better one gallon equals 10 pounds how spooky is that well it's not spooky at all because all weights and measures were devised on things that everybody had ready access to so if people could measure water they could measure weights instead of that merchant that traveled from town to town on his donkey carrying a load of weights in his rucksack he was able to just carry a jug when he got to the town he could fill it up with water people could bring out their jugs they could compare it make sure that his jug was the right size and then say okay we know that that jug weighs a given amount that wasn't a kilo because they didn't have kilos back then but at some point we decided that one liter would equal one kilo one gallon would equal 10 pounds unless of course you are American if you're American this doesn't work because your one gallon belongs to the period of Queen Anne 1720 or something like that you adopted a gallon which was devised in those times which isn't what we call a true gallon in other words we go eight pints one gallon that's a British pint and that gives us 10 pounds in weight so your gallon comes up at eight pounds something or another this was a god given gift for you all you had to do is take it and look happy but instead you just went for your own stupid system it's a bit like language we gave you the lovely english language what did you do with it well we know what you did with it <laughs> i'm only joking fellas come on have a sense of humor so these weights and measures get even better because if we look at that and we look at a thousand liters 
then we know that a thousand liters is one metric ton. It's also one cubic meter. So it's brilliant. If you're a plumber, you can calculate the size of water vessels. You're putting a tank into the loft, a water storage tank into the loft. You look at it and you say, well, it's a hundred gallon tank. So therefore it's going to weigh a thousand pounds, which is a lot. So I better put a few beefy supports in there for it because we don't want to sag in ceiling. I've seen that before where the tank has dropped through the ceiling and given the people sleeping in bed a bit of a nasty surprise. So while we're in the mood for numbers, let's have a look at this one. Four degrees Celsius, as I'm told. I mustn't call it centigrade anymore because apparently they changed it back in 1960 something. So I've been calling it centigrade all this time and I'm wrong, it's Celsius. But anyway, four degrees remains. Nobody's changed that. What does four degrees mean? Four degrees is the temperature at which water is at its most dense. In other words, it's absolutely rock solid. You cannot compress it. You can't do anything with it. At four degrees centigrade, it's there. Now, you would imagine, you think, why, water's dense? Why is water dense? You know, it seems like pretty soft stuff. But if you've ever done a belly flop, if you've ever gone off a, a diving board and you haven't got it quite right and you've hit that water on your stomach, then you'll know just how sore and how uncomfortable that is. Water can be like, if you get it wrong, it could be like landing on concrete. It's not fun. So it is pretty amazing stuff. It gives, but it only gives if it's got somewhere to go. When you look at water and it freezes, it expands. And between four degrees centigrade and naught degrees centigrade, water expands by 10%. Here we have an iceberg. If I hadn't told you, you probably wouldn't know. But anyway, that's an iceberg. And that is the water level. So we've got one tenth of that iceberg is above the water and the other nine tenths is below the water line. That happens because the water, as it's frozen, has expanded. And as it's expanded by 10%, that same amount of water is now lighter. So it's not all going to sit below the surface. Because it's lighter than the surrounding water, it's going to float to the top by the amount at which it's lighter, which just happens to be 10%. So that's something we know. And the practical application for that is if you're putting pipes into a building, if you're putting vessels in and there's a chance of them freezing, you know that it's going to expand by 10%, which means that you've got to put in some kind of protection against frost, insulation and things like that. Now, incidentally, insulation doesn't work the way you think it works. I've been to many, many burst pipes and pipes in the winter where they've had frozen water supplies and the ice has formed inside the insulation and long after the temperature has risen above freezing, that water in that pipe is still frozen because the insulation that was keeping the cold out is now keeping the cold in. So it's not enough to just simply take your holiday home and think I'll leave the water on and just wrap up the pipes and think that's going to save you from bursting. What you must do is you must drain those systems down. Now I used to go to quite a lot of jobs like that, draining properties down. If properties were left, the insurance companies would insist that a plumber came along, drained those properties down. And if people went away, if they weren't leaving their heating on, then they had their properties drained down when they were away in the Caribbean for the three months of the winter. But I also had to go along and fill them up again and watch and just check that everything was okay and there were no burst pipes. So it's a nice little job to do that. What you can do is you can leave your heating on, by the way, and turn your stopcock off. I would recommend you do that because I've also been out to many, many houses where people have gone away on holiday. They've come back, they've walked through the front door and the first thing they've got is wet feet and the whole house has been flooded because quite an innocent little leak sometimes has just been working there for two weeks, flooding the house while they've been away. So I would always recommend that you know where to turn your water off, first of all, because a lot of people don't, and that you turn it off if you're going away for prolonged periods. Now you can still leave your heating on. It won't do any harm to have your central heating ticking over when your mains water is switched off. A lot of people ask me about that, and that's the case. So just rest assured you can go turn, especially if you live in a flat, because it's devastating in a flat. Sometimes the people upstairs have gone away on holiday, they've locked the place up like Fort Knox, and then all 
Bank of England, let's say, and then the water has started pouring through the ceiling and the poor people below can't do anything about it except break in the house and turn the water off, which is a terrible thing to have to do. I've been out to a few of those jobs as well. So we know that water expands by 10%. We know that we've got to guard against that and it's generally a bad thing, which is of no real use to plumbers. But we also know that if we go from four degrees to 100 degrees, water boils. At sea level, pure water will boil, I won't say pure, but pure-ish water will boil at 100 degrees centigrade. I said to you that it's at its most dense at four degrees centigrade and it expands by 10% as it freezes. When we go this way, when water turns to steam, it expands by an incredible, wait for it, not 17 times, 1,700 times. That water in that glass, if I didn't keep drinking it, if that was turned to steam, if it was boiled up past boiling point, that would be 1,700 glasses of water. Now this is very, very useful because if you think about a steam engine, that's a tremendous amount of force that you're able to generate just simply by boiling a bit of water, putting it into a cylinder and using that cylinder to drive a steam engine for a steam train or a mill engine or any of the other countless things that our wonderful forefathers, the Victorians, developed, James Watt and all those kind of people, hats off to James Watt if you're listening James, all those things were possible simply because water expands by 1,700 times. Now as it does it, you've got to be very, very careful about what you do. You can't mess about with that because that is a killer amount of pressure that you've got there. So if you've got something like a water cylinder, for example, in your house, Let's supposing that cylinder is fed by a tank in the loft. You have a bit of a freeze up there, as used to happen quite a lot back in the day. We got a bit of a freeze up there and we got a bit of a freeze up on the vent pipe. And this cylinder was on and back in the day these cylinders were fired up with coal fire or a range or something like that. Now they're done by gas boilers and electric elements, but it is possible for that cylinder to, if the thermostat fails or something like that, it is possible for a cylinder to rise to above 100 degrees centigrade. And if this is a good solid ice plug in here and a good solid ice plug in there, up in the loft, way above where it's being heated, if you like, then it is possible for that cylinder to blow sky high. It has happened as a vented cylinder most people would consider a vented cylinder to be a fairly safe item, but in actual fact, a vented cylinder, if it goes wrong, it can turn into a bomb. And when I say a bomb, it could take your house away and kill the occupants. It's happened and it will no doubt happen again. Now, another thing is, if you've got a valve on this cylinder, as you normally do have, you must never ever put a valve on here. I did go out to a job fairly recently where somebody, some well-meaning person, I thought, oh, I'm gonna stick a valve on there, stop the hot water coming out. And that is an absolute disaster. So never, ever do that. So the other thing we have is an unvented cylinder. Now, the unvented cylinder is a different kettle of fish, if you like. It operates from a supply of water from the mains, and that supply is governed so that it doesn't go to any more than three bar. Now in the UK, we make sure that that expansion is accommodated inside the cylinder. And we do that for a very good reason because we've also got on here a non-return valve, which will stop the water going back along the pipe and contaminating the drinking supply. But that means that if there's any expansion taking place in that cylinder, it can't take place back along the mains water. Now on the continent, they allow that to happen. And they allow it to happen in America, I believe. And so it's a perfectly good system, but we don't have it. What we have to do is we have to put in some kind of expansion vessel. And that expansion vessel, you may have seen it. It'd be a round thing normally and it'll be hanging on the wall, and that expands, that, that's got a membrane inside it, and that expands to take the extra water. As the water's heated up, it's not gonna be 1,700 times, by the way, because not, we're not taking it to boiling point and steam, but it will expand, and we have to make sure that that expansion vessel is big enough to accommodate the amount of expansion that's taking place in that cylinder. Now, the other thing that you sometimes get is what we call a bubble top cylinder which means that the 
pipe that's going out the cylinder comes down into the cylinder there. So it's taking the water from, so let's do this right because then you get the hot water. There's the hot water and the hot water is going up to about there, but that top bit there is just fresh air. So that one is where the expansion takes place inside the cylinder. It's going up and down, up and down. Now in the end, those bubbles get displaced. And so what we have to do is we have to drain the cylinder down on the expansion and temperature relief valve, which is on the side. We drain that cylinder down to the point where the water drops to below. So once that stops running, we know the water levels drop to below and that will replenish, so long as we've got a hot tap open, by the way, that will replenish the air inside that cylinder and give us another three months, six months, or maybe even a year. But that's one of the things that is done on a service call. If you've got a bubble top cylinder, they make sure that the air bubble is replenished. Now you also get expansion on a central heating system. And very often, if you've got a combination boiler inside the boiler, Right tucked in the side there usually will be a long slim expansion vessel. So the same thing will happen in there. There'd be a little bit of expansion into there, but there's air in the top and there's a little valve there so you can pump up the air. So long as that expansion vessel has got air inside it and it's allowed to expand up and down on that cushion, you'll be all right. But if you notice that your pressure is dropping, on the central heating system, it can be because this expansion vessel is either leaking, it's defunct, or simply that it's lost air pressure and it needs topping up, which you can look on the boiler instruction, you can see how that's done, and normally it's a job for a service engineer to come around and do it, but it is one of the reasons why people get persistent pressure loss out of their central heating system. You also sometimes find that you've got a expansion vessel on the pipe work, big thing, out here, as I say, usually uh, it would be red in this case if it was central heating system. So that's red there. That would do the same job. It comes off a pipe and it would allow for that expansion. Now, if you go and put in something like underfloor heating into your house and you increase the water capacity, so you've done away with your radiators and you've increased your water capacity, uh, you will find that you need a bigger expansion vessel. So this one inside the combi, was only good enough really to take care of a few radiators. If you've got a bigger system, you need to add an expansion vessel to the system to allow for that extra capacity of water that's expanding and contracting. Having said that, because you run a underfloor heating system at a cooler temperature, it doesn't expand as much. So you do win a little bit there. If you're keeping your underfloor heating system to say 50 degrees centigrade, somewhere around there, then the expansion in the water is not nearly as much as if you're running it on radiators at 80 degrees centigrade. So that's just my brief run through some of the properties of water and how those properties affect you in everyday life. I would just end by saying, apparently it takes 20 gallons of water to make one pint of beer. Incredible really, isn't it? But you might wonder where that goes to, that water. Well, in the case of my local pub, I reckon it's still in the beer. So water is a very, very valuable resource and obviously none of us will be here if it weren't for the fact that this planet is blessed with a water supply and three fifths of the world is covered in water and they reckon there's an awful lot more in underground lakes all over the world, massive underground lakes. There's one under London, for example, and there's one under the Sahara, about the size of Wales, I'm told. Everything's about the size of Wales or about the size of 10 London buses. Anyway, there it is, water ready for us to grab, except that it's so deep, so far down that we can't drill down far enough to get it. And if we get down there, we haven't got a pump powerful enough to bring it up. So the Sahara, given the fact it's got all that water underneath it, really shouldn't be the Sahara Desert, it should be the Sahara Forest, but there you go, that's life, and it looks like it's gonna remain the Sahara Desert for a long time to come. So hopefully we all carry on being blessed with a clean and plentiful water supply, and they reckon there's gonna be wars over water in the future, and you can see that happening. There are some real hot disputes about who the water belongs to, and there is an agreement that you don't cut off another country's water supply, but that's beginning to happen. So so watch this space, Water Wars, it's on its way. Forget Star Wars, we've got Water Wars now. I'm Roger Bisbee. If you've got a topic that you want me to cover, then just pop it in the comments down below and I'll do my best to oblige. Thank you for watching. If I had to drink just one drink for the rest of my life, it wouldn't be beer, 
wouldn't be anything else, it would be water. It's not a plug, by the way. Nobody's paying us for this video. <laughs>